I'm going to be talking about comics and cartoons, which I think is a perfect Saturday morning. <laughs> um, so bring the kids. And as Ursula said, uh, well, Ursula mentioned the title of the book that I've just completed, actually. And what I'm presenting today is really the first part of the first chapter of the book, which is called The Poetics of Slumberland, Animated Spirits and the Animated Spirit. It's going to be coming out, I suppose, next year from the University of California Press. So let's get into it. Wow. Um, okay, I'm going to read, I'm sorry, but I'll try to look up a lot. Um, the saga of Windsor McKay's full-color Fantasia, Little Nemo in Slumberland, began very auspiciously on October 15, 1905, in the pa pages of the Sunday comic supplement of the New York Herald. A lovely prose text, which you can barely see there, all the more impressive for being squeezed in beneath Windsor McKay's superb illustrations, guides the reader through that first adventure. In this earliest incarnation, speech balloons are used minimally. I wonder what the oomph will say. Oh. Uh, the narrative is conveyed by the running, hopefully numbered captions and the art. The page is masterfully constructed, six tiers, each with a pair of equally sized panels, except for the first tier in which the immense king of slumberland overlooks all that follows, and the four panel sequence at the bottom as Nemo tumbles through space and, in the final image, out of his bed. McKay has infused the page with his characteristic design work. The second tier presents Nemo in bed facing right. In the first panel, the Yoompa introduces himself, and in the next, he presents Nemo with Somnus, the magical horse. In the two panels below, Nemo remains on the left side of the panel, but now astride his magical mount. The oomp promises some additional excitement. Slumberland is the most wonderful place in the sky. You mustn't miss a thing. See it all. And in the next panel, Nemo and Somnus gallop through space, encountering the oomp in the form of a huge white bird. Gracious, what is that? The next four panels across two tiers present the race, replete with bunnies riding pigs and monkeys atop green kangaroos, all jumping the hurdles of bursting stars that surround them all. Nemo loses his mount in the last panel of this self-contained race sequence, diving headfirst through the, through the reins, leading to his final tumble through space in the final four panels, which are arranged in a regular series of squares along the bottom tier. And there is, perhaps most spectacularly, the evocation of movement, which pervades this single page. One image in particular leaps out. After we see Somnus pawing the ground, clearly eager to be off, she is depicted in full gallop, bearing Nemo toward the wonders of slumberland. McKay has depicted the horse in what can only be described as the Mybridge position, with all four legs lifted from the ground. Nor is this the only image that recalls the pioneering work in motion capture <coughs> performed by both Edward Mybridge and Etienne Jules Marais in the ninth, late 19th century. Indeed, the evenly sized panels arranged in a graph-like configuration uh, presenting the successive stages of a horse's gait could hardly be more clear. The stages of the animal's motion will provide visual continuity, dynamic flow, and importantly, credible naturalistic detail across the six central panels. Within two of the panels, the beasts leaping the hurdles produce elegant arcs of motion that can be read from left to right, almost as stages in a single movement, as in a chronophotograph. And Nemo's final tumble is a backward somersault divided into four images with the last back in the waking world representing a kind of somersaultus interruptus with all the precision and perhaps more of one of my bridges photographic sequences. So let me talk a little bit about chronophotography before returning to the world of comics. Mybridge and Marais both used photography to cap, oh and I just want to add one other uh, lovely Little Nemo, which I think also plays with my Bridgian chronophotographic sequence with movement, with the animation of this running bed. This is one of the most well-known sequences. Um, my Bridge and Murray both used photography to capture and display the stages that comprise the continuum of movement. Murray was a physician and amateur naturalist, and it, he attempted through a series of mechanisms to record and recreate the movement of bird and insect wings, as well as the running gates of horses and men. 
He recognized the value of optical toys like phenakistoscopes and other similar amusements. He wrote, this instrument, usually constructed for the amusement of children, generally represents grotesque or fantastic figures moving in a ridiculous manner. But, he saw, with images constructed with care that represented faithfully the successive attitudes of the body, a more accurate understanding of physiological movements might be possible. Now, my bridge, as the story goes, and stop me if you've heard this one, uh, the governor of California, one Leland Stanford, uh, became aware of the experiments that Moray was conducting over in, in France and employed the very well-established panoramic and stereographic photographer, Edward Mybridge, to set up a wager to find out whether or not all four of a, a, a horse's legs ever left the ground while the horse was running at the same time. No one ever knew this. Uh, Mybridge set up a series of cameras with trip wires, recorded the gait of a running horse, looked at the successive photographs, and indeed in one photograph, quite clearly, all four horses um, were uh, off the ground. So there you go. Um, Mybridge continued to experiment with sequential photography for the rest of his career, producing book-length studies of human and animal movements, and sometimes also demonstrating his zoopraxis scope where he reanimated the still photographs of the chronophotographic sequence in an early form of animated filmmaking or in animated film projection. Marais began using uh, a different device, something called a chronophotographic gun in 1882 to take photographic sequences of birds in flight, fencing lunges and the like. My bridges technique produced individual images on a series of photographic plates. I showed you uh, an example of a couple of images ago, and I know they're quite familiar. Marais technique used an advancing disc that would advance automatically as the trigger worked, essentially, to capture the multiple vectors of motion, up and down, forward, back, whatever, in a series of exposures captured on a single plate, not in a series of, of images. So his images looked more like this. The chronophotograph here uh, combined the empirical weight and mimetic precision of the photograph with the plotted precision of the graph. Marais' single exposures yielded evenly spaced intervals in an unambiguous sequence extracted from continuous motion. And uh, there's a book called Picturing Time by Marta Braun in which she really celebrates uh, Marais' achievement at the expense of Mybridge's, basically arguing that Mybridge uh, cheats all over the place, his stuff is less scientifically reliable, and that it's also very informed by narrative and classical pictorial codes, uh, which she finds distracting. Other people have found that to be part of the fascination of Mybridge. Um, as I'm truncating that part of my discussion. Braun emphasizes the difference between Marais' scientism and Mybridge's formalism. Mybridge's use of multiple spatially organized cameras, as well as his characteristic display of discreetly bounded, pleasingly composed images, privileges, uh, privileged a sense of time as divisible and discreet. Contained parcels of space become analogous to contained parcels of time. Marais' single plates, by contrast, emphasized a temporal continuum, with the chronophotograph capturing instants along the axis of time's continuous arrow. Against Marais' scientific interest in graphing movement, Mybridge was, through his three <coughs> images, each carefully lit and composed according to acceptable aesthetic conventions, telling stories in space. Again, I'll skip much of that discussion, uh, distinguishing between them. The act of segmentation and the spatial display of stages of movement on a grid generated new concepts of the relation between image and world. The organization and display of recorded moments projected the sense of temporal continuity and its relentless rationality, but it also incontrovertibly showed that time could be fractured our awareness of it newly dispersed along a series or array of demonstrably incomplete images. Each image needs the ones on either side of it to, to meet. Comics became prominent as a popular medium around the same period as these motion studies. 
and uh, what Jonathan Crary has talked about regarding the temporal rupture offered by MyBridge's uh, photographic arrays really echoes what someone like Scott McCloud says about comics, about the organized array of panels that characterize comics. In his words, the array fractures both time and space, offering a jagged staccato rhythm of unconnected moments. Comics, this is me again, comics uniquely present a combination of static images, often infiltrated by visual cues of capture or continuing movement, arranged in temporal sequence. Comics more clearly resemble what MyBridge produced than what the Edison Company and the Lumiere's followed it with. In other words, many people begin, I do too, a, a history of film by showing my previous chrono photographs. But really, you know, what happens there is, a, well, I'll talk about that, but comics resemble the photograph more than films resemble chrono photographs. To return briefly to the issue of Mybridge's aesthetics, Philip Proger has pointed to some of the means by which Mybridge's sequences rupture and man the usual relationship between photographic image and temporality. Walking Elephant that you see here is a photographic array that can be read either as a photographic study of a single elephant or as a chain of multiple elephants marching, you know, tail to trunk in parade. These are methods that um, comics quickly adapt. Windsor McKay does something like it in that first little Nemo as the various and multi hued horses, kangaroos, and billy goats are arranged along a single elegantly undulating arc of movement that extends across each panel and from one panel to the next. Comics, like cinema, um, depended on the work of Mybridge, Marais, other early experimenter, experimenters like Renault, and the host of others who experimented with recording and reproducing natural movement in the later 19th century. Comics and cinema both offer experiences of temporal fracturing and temporal flow, but the comics reader has more control over time than the cinematic spectator, with the freedom to look back or peek ahead. Time in comics is represented as territory and space, and the experience of the flow of time can be very carefully regulated, if not completely controlled. It can't be completely controlled, but it can be carefully regulated. This dialectic between the stasis of an individual image and the spatiotemporal movement of the sequence, a dialectic that relates to the, the diegesis of whatever is going on, but also to the experience of the reader of the comic, is what Scott McCloud calls the temporal map, and it is a conceptual fundament of the medium of comics. Modern culture from the late 19th century forward oscillated between the sense of time as unbound, mutable, and multiple, and time as rigid, deterministic, and most insistently bound to linear coherence. Mybridge's first studies represent a crucial moment in the unbinding of time and perspective, and Crary and McLeod locate in cinema and the comics, respectively, the two media that most clearly derive from these experiments, some of that same radicalism. Cinema reconstituted the movement that one could infer from the sequence of still images, while comics retained the synchronous spatiotemporal array or temporal map. But both media were fundamentally bound to the explorations of time, rhythm, and, and tempo, so characteristic of the culture of modernity. The pictorial narrative had existed as a printed form throughout Europe and Asia since the 15th century. But from the middle of the 19th century, it began to emphasize a sense of continuous movement that was new to the form. The closing chapter of David Kunzel's indispensable analysis of pre-20th century comics emphasizes the sophistication with which comics became, in effect, motion pictures influenced both by such optical toys as the Magic Lantern and the Phenakistoscope, as well as the experiments associated with Marais and Mybridge. In a later essay, Kunzel demonstrates how the large, complete, and richly accoutred compositions associated with Hogarth, who did series of paintings with, with a narrative following a rake's progress or a harlot's progress or whatever, 
uh, yielded, this, this detailed re rendering yielded to the line of caricature, a line that was looser, more exaggerated, and just evidently faster in keeping with a perception that life itself was becoming faster paced, careening in potentially dangerous, albeit thrilling, directions. Rudolf Töpfer, um, a Swiss creator of written picture narratives that uh, found great admirers among people like Goethe, um, Tupper eschewed scenic detail to emphasize dynamic figures trapped in chaotic circumstances. He also developed what Kunzel terms a battery of montage devices to emphasize time and motion, including narrowing the frame from panel to panel to indicate both the quickness of succession and the concomitant claustrophobia of temporal inescapability. Increasing numbers of comic artists played with image sequences that modeled a brief, contained arc of time. Um, an 1868, oh, I have these in the wrong order, let me do this first. An 1868 illustration by Georges de Maurier for Punch presented three stages in the leap of a horse and rider over a fence superimposed onto a single image. This is obviously reminiscent of Marais images with successive stages on a single plate. Later, Punch published several parodies of Mybridge, such as an 1882 zoopraxiscopic sequence of an eminent actor's histrionics. He seems to burst into flames at the end of his performance. Thus, Windsor McKay's presentation of continuous time through the vehicle of animal locomotion had some significant and precise precedents. And it's worth reviewing some of the ways that comics in the 19th century evolved as a vehicle for the registration of time through the figure of animal and child movement. The extremely popular children's stories and social satires by the German illustrator Wilhelm Busch, I'll show some images of his later, often depicted brief actions across several panels from a fixed perspective that emphasized incremental change, measuring with metronomic inevitability the results of the calamitous pranks committed by those early masters of comic strip mayhem, Max and Moritz. And they appeared in 1865, actually quite, quite ahead of uh, chronophotography. Cat and Mouse from 1864 laid the foundation for a whole history of feline rodent or coyote roadrunner conflicts in comic strips and cartoons by reducing conflict itself to a reductio ad absurdum of cause and effect moves and counter moves. Bush's genius, Consul argues, lay in his ability to impose absolute linear and conceptual control over actions and situations out of control. The American illustrator A.B. Frost, I'll show some of his later too, took up art studies with Thomas Aikens in 1878, when the painter had become interested in using photography and chronophotography to represent movement in his work more naturalistically. Frost's picture stories, again centered around animal behaviors very frequently, quickly began to manifest a chronophotographic smoothness again in works of vehement and hilarious sadism, such as Our Cats Eat Rat Poison, uh, which was in Harper's Magazine in 1881. I'll show that a little bit. The visual language developed by Frost and Bush is extended in the series of strikingly elegant scripts Adolf Billet and uh, Theophile Alexander Steinlin produced for the pages of the French journal Chat Noir. Steinlin's pages demonstrated a virtuosic display of feline body language and a new precision in the rendering of time. Charting the progress of the cat's attempts to land a goldfish or get its head unstuck from a basket or its play with a ball of yarn, one marks the smooth passage of moment to moment. Here, movement is mapped at a slower, more even pace with a pre-cinematographic but post-Mybridgian scientific exactitude. The flexible figure of the monochromatic cat, whose adventures were usually organized in series against a blank field with the most minimal scenic detail, was a legible icon, a line of dark graphemes writing time across the space of the page. A flowing, more improvisational line the sense of an illustration as incomplete unless viewed as part of a, sentence, a sequence, and an increasing emphasis on what McLeod categorizes as moment-to-moment -moment transitions as opposed to action-to-action -action or scene-to-scene. 
um, all of these contributed to the increasing association of comics and movement, often through the vehicle of animal motion. By the way, I just want to show a very nice sort of pre-future, you know, actually fully <laughs> keeping in modern art, uh, a rendering of movement in a single image. I mean, this, this, is, this finds its way to other works as well. All this, uh, and so in the first episode of Little Nemo, Somnus galloping across the panels arrayed on the page is emblematic of the new representations of time and motion. But Somnus is equally a figure of arrested motion, frozen in every single panel, including in that one perfect posture that Mybridge first revealed to the world of human sight with four legs off the ground. With Little Nemo, McKay demonstrated an unprecedented and some would say unmatched mastery, <coughs> mastery of temporal mapping while returning to the spatial solidity and scenic richness associated with artists like Hogarth. That's something I explore in a, uh, the second chapter of my book, is that combination of the quickness of movement and the solidity of rendering. It seems to be obvious, as the preceding review indicates, that despite the efforts to backdate the origin of comics, and you know, like every new medium that comes under academic scrutiny, everybody wants to claim a great pedigree. So it's a like, cave paintings are the first comics. Okay, great. You know. But uh, and the, the traditional view has been that comics begin with newspaper comics in America, maybe early 19 or later 19th century work by Tuchferin and Shop Noir, but no earlier than that. And I actually want to go with that kind of definition for this reason. It seems to me that despite the efforts to backdate the origin of comics, the medium does fundamentally change in the wake of Mybridge and Murray and, its famed photo and their famed photographic works. Comics display a more evident interest in temporality, de depicting precise moments arranged in a legible sequence, juggling a sense of both the instantaneous and the causal. And if comics are marked by a new rapidity of production, the looser line, and diegesis, smaller units of represented time. One could also note a new rapidity of consumption as well. With the rise of the American newspaper comic strips and sections, a vast new audience was introduced on a regular basis to this medium. The comic strip became something to read quickly and dispose of, a part of the ephemera of modern life, which made them different from Hogarth's prints to first books, and even popular magazines such as Punch and Shock Noir in Europe, which did not circulate as widely as newspapers. They become a medium of the instant. Now I want to uh, begin to talk about the, the ideological valence of this and where comics diverge from the chronic photograph. Another McKay strip, Dream of the Rarebit Fiend, often presented adult middle-class men or women uh, trapped in escalating transfiguration of everyday life. The strip repeatedly connected dream content to the stresses and strains of modern life, bringing to mind the tremendous emphasis that was placed on the polarities of efficient and fatigued bodies in the industrial workplace from the mid-19th century onwards. The metaphor of the machine was strenuously applied to the laboring bodies of the industrial age. In the discourse of production, Fatigue replaced idleness as the enemy of productive labor. The avoidance of work was less significant than the body's productive limits. The human motor, as Anson Rabenbach's uh, a book set, centralizes, brings back that term that was in common use in the ni late 19th century. The human motor needed to be properly cared for if it was to function with maximum efficiency. It needed proper nutrition, improved hygiene, and a sufficient but not excessive amount of sleep. Instrumental reason had to contend with the imperfection of the human body, a, m a motor that was not fully capable of assimilating the stressful pace of modernity, the shock of industrial accidents, and the grinding repetition of the assembly line or office workplace. To increase efficiency and maintain a viable labor force, the human body had to be studied, its movements graphed and analyzed, its smallest motions made visible to the scientific eye. This is the context in which the scientific visualization of movement must be situated. Marta Braun writes, 
very nicely. Marais' studies of locomotion had an enormous influence on the artists of Europe, Braun, Braun writes, but their more enduring and pervasive effects were on the workers of the world. Marais' graphical data served the instrumental rationality of industrial development. Taylorism was predicated on time and motion studies that allowed every task to be disassembled into its constituent parts that could be repeated in the same way by anyone. The visualization of movement was innately bound to the regulation of movement within the context of industrial production. As the 19th century moves to a close, the body in comments is increasingly depicted as deformed by the machineries of, industrial, of industrialism. A growing catalog of kinetic effects, including oscillating or blurred outlines, uh, and of course motion lines, conveyed a stronger sense of motion, but also conjured a body violently reacting to the power of technological might. And David Kunzel has written about this, and I have a quote from Kunzel followed by a quote from Tom Guy. The body, Kunzel writes, is experienced as a machinoid or a machinable substance, and both fear and fascination reside in the artist's rendering of the body as a machine almost beyond recognition. Gunning has written that Mybridge's photography captured and made visible, and this is a key point that he makes, and I think it's terribly important, that's why I want to read this uh, lengthy quote, captured and made visible a drama that would otherwise remain invisible, the physical body navigating a modern space of calculation. His images of the new human body, framed within a geometrically regular grid, often with numbers and, and gridded hash marks, capture the transformations of modern life brought on by technological change and the new space-time they inaugurated as naked flesh moves within a hard-edged, rational framework. Comics also participate in this rationalist impulse to map the moving body's navigation of graph space. The breakdown of movement that occurs in, in the work of Bush, Steinlin, or McKay is part of this history, blending animal locomotion with narrative and gag structures across the pages of magazines, newspapers, or storybooks. But, and here comes the main point, but comics do more than replicate the fixed viewpoints and measured progress of chronophotography. The humorous or gag strips rather sustainedly parody or perhaps caricature the worldview that underlay the visualization and analysis of movement. The eminent actor striding the stage in Punch's parodic zoopraxiscopic study is an early example of a parody of a chronophotographic sequence, but he's not alone. When Wilhelm, uh, I'm sorry, when uh, Wilhelm Busch uses the fixed uh, viewpoint to chart the stages of movement, what we find is the measured onset of chaos or disorder. The mischievous crow, who stars in 1867's Hans Huckebein, uh, systematically leaves his tracks across the clean laundry, knocks over a row of plates and a bowl full of eggs before spilling a pail of beer down the master's boots. The final pages of the story comprise a satisfying chronophotographic sequence. In 11 images, Hans takes a sip of wine, tilts his head back to swallow, samples a little more, staggers about the table, teeters into a sewing kit, and then uh, accidentally hangs himself. End of the story. <laughs> Leaving the Teutonic sense of humor aside for the moment, <laughs> what is significant is that the visualization of animal locomotion has now been appropriated to describe the breakdown of order and the unleashing of the forces of entropy. Something similar makes itself felt in A.B. Frost's Our Cat Eats Rat Poison, which the felines' increasingly frenzied yet measured contortions yield to the ultimate image of its prostrate form. While these strips generate disorder from frenzy and chaos, generate disorder from frenzy and chaos, the final image is often one of severely restricted movement or even its complete cessation. And this is a point that Rick Vinograd is sitting over there made to me when I did this paper a while ago. We have a crow hanged, a cat poisoned, still another tangled in and seemingly swallowed by a ball of yarn. But the masterpiece of comic art that demonstrates this parodic tendency most obsessively is Windsor McKay's Little Sammy Sneeze. The strip is organized around an invariant structure of six, usually six, sometimes eight panels, 
A delicate process is delineated step by maddening step over the space of four panels. Sammy occupies a fixed position as he begins this stupefyingly predictable windup to his inevitable, uh, this is my, def I looked up the definition of sneeze, involuntary violent expiration of air through the nose and mouth. Sammy Sneeze's tagline up above there read, he never knew when it was coming, but the reader knew exactly when it was coming. Panel five. Over the first four panels, his nose starts to itch. Um, e, ah, 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 ka, and finally in the fifth panel, chow. The illustration details the immediate effects of the explosion. So here, uh, you know, in advance of bringing that baby, the dinosaur skeleton collapses. Here, the, 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 the three-card Monty guy or salesman stuff. Um, here, of course, the array of groceries collapses. That's got to be there. Here, the fancy uh, dinner party is disrupted by sneezing the soup all over. Here's one of my favorites where uh, Sammy's holding the candle to help his father. And, and the pattern is now so well established, and this is relatively early script, that you don't even need to see the, 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 the mess in the fifth panel. You can just like, fill it in yourself. Sammy remains where he is, a stable object against the chaotic repercussions of 